Hello and welcome to this event, What's in a Sentence, which is part of Victorian Law Week. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples and traditional owners and custodians of the land and waterways upon which our lives depend. I acknowledge and pay my respects to ancestors of this country, elders, knowledge holders and leaders past and present, and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. My name is Ed and I'm the Media Manager at the County Court and I'll be moderating today's event. If you have any questions for the panellists, you can type them into the Q&A box at any time during the event, and I'll relay the questions to the judges later on. Depending on how many questions we get, we might not have time for them all, but I'll definitely do my best. We also have joining us today two Auslan interpreters, Eve and Fiona. If you wish to view them on screen, uh, change the view to gallery view. So on the panel for today's event is Chief Judge Peter Kidd and Deputy Chief Judge Meryl Sexton. I'll just run through some brief biographies. Chief Judge Peter Kidd was appointed uh, as Chief Judge of the County Court of Victoria in 2015. The Chief Judge holds a Master of Laws from the University of Geneva, where he specialised in international humanitarian and criminal law. His honour holds a dual commission as a Justice of the Supreme Court of Victoria. Before becoming Chief Judge, his honour had 20 years of experience as a criminal lawyer in Australia and overseas, mostly as a barrister and senior Crown Prosecutor in Melbourne. In the mid-2000s, the Chief Judge took his family to Sarajevo, where he was an international prosecutor at the War Crimes Chamber of the State Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Deputy Chief Judge Meryl Sexton was appointed as a judge of the County Court of Victoria on the 21st of August 2001. Her Honour was appointed as the first Deputy Chief Judge of the County Court on 22 February 2022. Her Honour began a legal career in criminal law, having first appeared in criminal trials in 1987. In 1995, she was appointed as a Crown Prosecutor in the Office of Public Prosecutions, a position held until her appointment to the court. And in October 2005, Her Honour became the inaugural judge in charge of the Sex Offences List of the County Court, a position that she held for a total of eight years. Her Honour has been a member of numerous committees at court, state and national levels. Her Honour holds a Bachelor of Economics and Bachelor of Laws from Monash University. She lectures extensively on the practice and procedure of criminal law to a variety of groups, particularly in relation to sexual offences and the evidence of children. Welcome. So we're going to kick off with some questions uh, for the judges just to start the conversation, but I can see already some questions coming through. So please use the Q&A box at any time um, to ask questions of the Chief and the Deputy. And just a quick reminder that the panel can't give legal advice or comment on specific cases, so keep them general. So I might start with you, Chief Judge. Maybe you can tell us about the main principles and the purposes of sentencing in courts. Thanks, Ed. Um, you can probably break it down into three uh, uh, major factors that need to be taken into account with sentencing. The first is we need to consider the circumstances of the offence. And in particular, the sentencing judge needs to make an assessment of the gravity of the offending. One of the purposes of sentencing is for the sentence to mark out the community's disapproval and denunciation of an offence. So obviously, if it's a very grave offence, the punishment must fit the crime in that sense. The second factor that we need to take into account is the impact upon the victim. The law requires the judge to assess uh, the, the harm caused to the victim. Uh, and indeed, in, in sentencing cases, the judge will often have uh, before him or her um, a statement from the victim or made on behalf of the victim detailing the harm caused to him or her. The third area that needs to be uh, taken into account when sentencing is the circumstances of the individual offender. So, for example, his or her age, a very young person, is likely to receive a different approach in sentencing than a much older person. Their background, do they have any prior convictions? And a judge is required to make an assessment of their prospects of reform or rehabilitation. Ultimately, the judge needs to balance all of these factors some of the factors pull in the direction of a harsh sentence or a harsher sentence. Other factors might pull in the direction of mercy. The challenge to a sentencing judge is that the judge must ultimately impose 
a just and appropriate sentence for the crime in question having regard to all those factors that I've said. And it's what we ultimately call individualised justice. The sentence itself is tailored to all of those individual uh, circumstances. So that's a very brief overview as to the main principles of sentencing. Thank you, Chief, for that thoughtful answer. I might just um, drill down on that some more with the Deputy Chief Judge. Are there different factors when sentencing a young person or, or an offender considered youthful? Yes, thanks, Ed. Um, there are different factors. The um, law provides that a youthful offender is someone under the age of 21. Then the law also defines a child as being under the age of 18. So if a judge is sentencing a person who was a youthful offender under the age of 21, um, then they can consider uh, rehabilitation as the main reason for in imposing sentence. In other words, trying to make sure that person doesn't reoffend, because ultimately that's not only good for the individual offender, but better for society if they're going to be a productive and non-criminal member of society. The Children's Court has the responsibility for uh, sentencing children, unless it is a, uh, a sentence that involves um, uh, a death, uh, so a murder charge or culpable driving causing death, in which case it can go to one of the higher courts. It's uh, therefore that's for children under 18. So the sentencing um, has that difference as well. Uh, I mentioned rehabilitation. The other difference is that if a person is aged between 15 and 21, then the sentencing judge can decide to impose a sentence of detention rather than imprisonment in a youth justice centre. And there are factors that have to be taken into account as to deciding whether that ultimately is appropriate. Thanks for that answer. Um, now, I just want to put the next question to both of you. Um, what are some of the more challenging components of sentencing, or is there a particular area as a judge that you find the most challenging? Uh, well, um, I mentioned before that uh, one of the challenges to sentence, sentencing is that we need to balance various factors, taking into account the individual circumstances of the offence, the victim, the offender, and obviously a sentencing judge has many audiences. Uh, there are those people directly affected by the crime, uh, there are the police in question who've investigated the matter. There's the community um, at large. And uh, it's not always easy to please everyone. Uh, ultimately, the role of a sentencing judge is not to please any particular person. We're not there to do that. We're guided by a set of legal principles, which we're bound by law to apply to reach a just and reasonable outcome. And uh, it will often be the case that some people involved in the case or even perhaps members of the public may not be happy with the outcome of the sentence. And I suppose just taking that one step further, it's just getting the sentence right. Sentencing is actually a really complex exercise. Um, uh, the Deputy Chief Judge and myself have just spent a few minutes trying to summarise sentencing, but the reality is uh, that it's very complex and there's a lot of law that we have to apply. And just as an example, I, I hope you can see this, but this is the Sentencing Act, um, uh, which is the statute which covers the law of sentencing in addition to other case law, and it's, it's nearly 600 pages uh, long. So it's a complex uh, exercise legally. And I can add to that to say that uh, judges who sit in the criminal jurisdiction in this court would all agree that sentencing is just about the hardest part of the job. And that's because we take it seriously and as well as the fact that it's got so many moving parts that have to be taken into account, as the Chief Judge has said. So it's uh, not just the Sentencing Act, that uh, couple of inches or a few centimetres uh, size that you've just seen, 600 pages or so, but also the Chief Judge mentioned the case law and uh, we are assisted uh, often by the barristers who appear for the parties to point us in the right direction, but we also have to have our own um, ability to uh, seek out the principles that particularly apply in circumstances. 
So that can be a challenge too, if you've got a particularly complicated case, or even if you've got a case that's unusual and therefore there's not much assistance from other cases. So then you have to really sort through for yourself. So it's a very challenging thing to get to the right answer, but the right answer can be different for different judges looking at it, the same uh, set of facts. So it's as right as we can make it, what we're comfortable with in the end. And also, uh, every case is different. So even if you've had one that's similar, you know that you're looking at this one individually, as the chief judge said, and uh, individualised justice. And so therefore, even though you've done something similar, you will always be looking at each case as it has come to you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Just on that, in terms of individual judges making decisions that may vary from case to case, I might ask you this, Chief Judge, you've had a few questions come through about what happens when a judge gets it wrong, as it were. Is there a process in place for parties to challenge that? And how, how does that work in mm -hmm. terms? Yes, thank you for those questions. The uh, system that we have in place is actually self-correcting. Um, we have a hierarchical court system. Um, for example, we're here at the county court and judges here will impose sentences for serious indictable crime. Uh, if the parties are unhappy with the outcome or they consider that the judge has erred, then they can appeal and do appeal to the Supreme Court, and in particular, the Court of Appeal at the Supreme Court. And there, three judges will consider the sentence imposed by the judge, obviously with the assistance of the arguments of the barristers um, and considering the grounds of appeal. And the ground of appeal is essentially um, the nub of the argument as to why the judge erred. And the three justices will then consider whether there was an error and whether a, a new sentence or another sentence ought to be imposed. So it's a very important point that um, it is self-correcting. There is an opportunity to correct errors. Uh, we're not afraid of that as judges. We accept that that's part of the robust and transparent legal system that we have in this country. Um, I should say that most of the time, in fact, the, the large majority of the time, judges actually do get it right. Um, only a very small number of our sentences are appealed successfully. Most sentences are not even appealed. And even those sentences which are appealed, some of those don't succeed. But what matters is that if there is an error, uh, it's identified and corrected. Thanks, Chief. Good answer. Um, just a reminder to anyone watching, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. I'm really pleased to see the number that have been coming in already, though. Um, and it's always good to see that the viewers have been reading the news because we've had a few questions about COVID delays and how they might be affecting sentences. And I think very topical um, question. Maybe we could address it um, in terms of delay in general. Um, I'm not sure who wants to feel this one, but how does delay in, in a case being heard affect the sentencing outcome, if at all? Well, I'm happy to take that one uh, to start off with, um, Chief. So the um, delay is an important factor, uh, sometimes depending on what sort of delay, but generally speaking, if someone has had um, uh, time pass before they get to the point where they're being sentenced, then the court has to take into account what was the cause of the delay and what happened in the offender's life during the time of the delay. And that becomes uh, relevant then to deciding a part of the thing that you take into account in deciding the appropriate sentence. The uh, there may have been, um, strangely, a benefit if the person has had some time to show commitment to rehabilitation because they've had uh, more time than they might have otherwise had over a couple of years to show that they have gone through a drug treatment program, for example. But that's uh, usually the um, exception, and I mean by that, not that people don't go through programs, but that usually people have been unable to... Um, move on with their lives and have been really held in limbo waiting to see what the outcome of their sentence is, uh, of their case is, particularly if it's a very serious crime and they have a high expectation of going to prison. So delay for that reason is usually something that we take into account as um, what we call mitigating uh, the uh, um, sentence that would otherwise be imposed. In other words, 
it's a potentially reducing factor. The um, uh, COVID, though, has a separate overlay. I don't know whether you want to address that part. Well, I, I can address the, the uh, one aspect to it because there are many aspects to it. And indeed, what the Deputy Chief Judge has just described is a good example of individualised justice. Every, every case will be different. Um, but there is another aspect to COVID uh, which impacts sentencing. If somebody pleads guilty to sentencing, then uh, to an offence, uh, then um, rather than uh, exercise their right to go to trial, then the community receives a benefit to that. There's what we call a utilitarian benefit. Uh, there's a saving of time and money from the expense of running a trial. Uh, complainants are saved the additional trauma of being subjected to a trial and potentially cross-examined. So there are community benefits in people pleading guilty. If no one pleaded guilty, the system would essentially collapse. So what the law says is that if you plead guilty, you get this uh, um, sentencing discount or a, a mitigating uh, factor is taken into account because of the, the practical benefits of pleading guilty. Since COVID, the law further says that if you plead guilty during COVID, when there have been there, these delays and where there is a backlog of cases, then that benefit to the community by reason of that plea of guilty is even greater. And so a sentencing judge must take into account that the entry of the plea of guilty attracts even a greater benefit today in the COVID period than it would have previously. So that's another uh, aspect to COVID uh, which can impact upon sentencing. Thank you, Chief. We've had some really interesting questions come through and there's a focus on um, sex offender registration. And I wonder if I might ask you, Deputy Chief, your extensive experience in this, this space, what are some of the factors the judge has to take into account when considering placing someone on a sex offender register? Well, thanks, uh, Ed, and uh, to the questioner for that one. Um, for sex offender registration, the majority of cases are um, that uh, come before the courts require registration. So in that sense, the sentencing judge has no discretion. And that's set out in the Sentencing Offender Registration Act. So that also provides the period of time for which a person must be registered and what they must do because they are a registered offender. Uh, a much lower number of sentencing, um, sorry, of uh, offences uh, provide for an option for the prosecution to apply to the court to have someone registered as a sex offender. And that's where the sentencing judge has a discretion. It is, as I said, a much smaller number. And you would take into account, uh, or you must take into account, the risk that the uh, offender would pose to uh, the community. That's one of the main important factors to take into account in deciding should they be registered uh, for a period of time in order to reduce that risk once you've found that one exists. If you find that the um, evidence before you shows that the risk is very low or non-existent, well then you would not exercise that uh, discretion to have them registered. But as I say, that's they're few and far between. Most of it is mandatory registration by operation of the law. Thanks for that, great answer. Um, I might just turn to media now, um, and I might start with you, Chief Judge. I had a few questions about how the media affects sentencing in high-profile cases. I think it might be worth breaking that down into two parts. Firstly, can media coverage of a case affect the imposition of the sentence, as in, does the judge have to take into account any mitigation? And also, what's the effect of media, if any, on the, the judge? Well, firstly, the media played an important role in uh, conveying the work of the courts to the public. There are um, many sources of information these days about what goes on in public institutions and public life, but certainly traditionally, the media is an important conduit between uh, what we're doing in the courts, the sentences we're imposing, and uh, the education of, of the public. Um, the the uh, media, uh, have, uh, because of that important role to play, uh, it's important that the courts provide access to the media um, to see the actual sentences being handed down and they can do that physically or during uh, the last two years with COVID, 
um, we've been able to provide, ensure that the media had access to important cases via the internet. Um, now, as for the legal impact upon sentences, they don't have any legal impact upon the sentences as a matter of law. I mentioned before the courts and judges are bound to sentence in accordance with the law and a set of legal principles. And that's what we do. And uh, whilst there may be high profile cases, which are attracting a lot of media attention, um, that fact alone doesn't influence uh, a judge. A judge approaches the task of sentencing dispassionately and objectively and professionally. Um, whether that person being sentenced uh, is, involves a case which attracts no publicity, whatever, or in some cases, if the person is the subject of greater and more extensive publicity, publicity, ultimately, the legal principles are the same for both people. And so in that sense, um, as a general principle, the judges are not influenced by that media coverage. Very good answer. I think it, it probably goes to what's been described as the Netflix effect in terms of public perceptions of sentencing um, in high profile cases, because there's obviously just so many um, pieces of content out there that show cases in other jurisdictions, perhaps. Um, and we have had questions about, um, you don't see too many life sentences along those lines. Do, does the court have any, is, does the court struggle with the perceptions of international jurisdictions in terms of media coverage? Is that something that we have to work to correct? Well, I'd say this much, and perhaps this, this answers uh, really responding to a broader question. Um, the media don't report on every case. Mm. Uh, in fact, it's probably not possible for them to cover every sentence. Indeed, one can go further and say that um, most sentences which are imposed, for example, in the county court on a daily basis receive little or no media coverage. So the media is selective in the cases which they cover. And so in some sense, uh, because it's selective, the public may be left with a misleading impression about the work of the courts. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's the kind of case that receives the attention of either the high profile um, offender uh, or if there's something salacious about the crime itself uh, and which might may be newsworthy. Um, and it's not for me to second guess what uh, the media chooses to cover. But the reality is that most of our sentences which we're handing down every single day in this court receive no media attention at all. So that's that is definitely a difficulty that in terms of the public's education, they are receiving a selective impression of the work of the courts. And I do think there's more work to be done there uh, to ensure that um, the education of the public about the work that we do is much broader. Thanks, Chief. Um, I might like, I'd like to ask you about community correction for this Deputy Chief. Um, we've had a few questions, um, one recently from James who asks, what factors go into whether an offender who's committed a serious offence would receive a community correction order that is not going to jail? Um, and, and how common are they? Well, thanks, James, and others for that question. Uh, can I refer, answer that by referring to two um, principles that uh, involve, uh, inform our sentencing discretion? The first is that there's a hierarchy of sentences and the second is that you cannot impose a more serious sentence than all of the circumstances that you are taking into account um, demand. So what that means is that when you come to look uh, way up all of those factors that you need to take into account, you look to see whether this is a case that um, you, where you have no alternative to uh, imprisonment, for example, if you're looking at a serious offence that would uh, have you at that level. If there is an alternative to imprisonment, then you must take it. And one alternative to imprisonment in the appropriate cases is a community correction order. And that's a community-based sentence which still provides for punishment uh, as well as rehabilitation, addressing the behaviour of the offender, but in the community. I should add that you can have imprisonment and then on release start a community correction order. So that's that's slightly different. But if somebody who is on the face of it charged with a very serious offence uh, is seen to be then just released immediately back into the community on a community correction order, 
then there will be been, uh, will have been this exercise of working out what is the most appropriate sentence. So a good example would be uh, a young offender, uh, but uh, they may not be uh, at the higher level of um, considering them for imprisonment in any event if they've got, for example, no criminal history, haven't been in trouble before. So you might be looking lower down the, the scale. But if they have been in trouble a lot before and they're still getting in trouble, you think, well, is there something that we can do, bearing in mind that rehabilitation is the primary purpose for sentencing a young offender, is there something that uh, the uh, a community correction order can provide that will address their offending behaviour and thereby put them on the right path and uh, protect the community in the end. And so you might consider uh, drug and alcohol treatment or mental health treatment, uh, as well as unpaid hours of community work. Uh, and that's a punishment side, although the order itself is quite strict. Uh, people might think it's, uh, it's obviously uh, less serious than imprisonment, but people might think, well, they've just been let out the door of the court and that's it. They have to turn up to be supervised. They can't leave Victoria without getting permission. They have to notify any change of address or employment. They have to receive visits from the community corrections officer, uh, as well as, they're, they're the core conditions that everyone has to abide by. And then if the judge puts special conditions on, like the ones I mentioned before, then this is really quite uh, an onerous obligation. And this can be for up to five years uh, in the exercise of the judge's discretion. So uh, in the end, um, judges have to look at what alternative is there to imprisonment uh, if there is an alternative, the community corrections order, uh, community correction order is the appropriate one uh, in many cases. I have to say that it can be a bit of a stop-start uh, event. You can get some people stumbling a bit, and uh, we try and avoid that with judicial monitoring. So uh, a judge can say, look, you come back and see me in two months and let me know how you're going. And there's uh, no lawyers involved. The community corrections officer is there and the, um, the offender. And you have a pretty down-to-earth talk with them about how they've been going, try and encourage them to do better and hope that that will avoid them not complying with the, um, the order in the end. So it's a real effort for the community in terms of community corrections officers uh, to work with the offender to prevent them from reoffending in the future and thereby making uh, a better society all around. Sometimes it works uh, and sometimes it doesn't. But that's the basic reason behind people who might otherwise be looking at a term of imprisonment. If there's an alternative, the judge must take it. Thank you for that. Just one follow-up as well. I think it's probably worth clarifying. The judge is relying on evidence to make these decisions, aren't they? It's not um, necessarily just the judge's assessment. There's uh, absolutely the like. Absolutely, that's a very good question. So a person who gets a community correction order will be assessed for that. And we have community corrections officers that assess them as to their level of risk, uh, what appropriate programs might be, although the judge will often consider um, suggesting programs. And all of that is based on the material that has been placed before the judge on the uh, plea, whether it's a plea of guilty at the outset or a plea uh, a hearing following a trial where there's a person who's been found guilty. The judge isn't just doing this in a vacuum. You've got the lawyers telling you this is the background of the offender that you might not have already uh, gleaned during the course of the hearing. Uh, these are their personal circumstances. The prosecution will make submissions about what uh, they consider to be suitable in terms of a, a sentencing um, outcome. And the judge takes all of that into account. So we can't, uh, sorry, I'll go back a step. We have to make a value judgment ultimately as to what is the appropriate sentence. But we don't just do that on the basis mm -hmm. of, oh, I think this is probably, it's a Tuesday, so this is sort of a, a sentence I'm going to give. You have to take all of these things into account, uh, including what has been placed before you by way of evidence and other material that you are entitled to take into account. And importantly, that uh, also includes, as the Chief Judge said earlier, uh, the victim impact statement and what uh, the victim may have had to say about the impact on them. That, I think that's a great answer, and I think it goes to um, some way to answering Kimberly's question, which was 
to understand the time between a plea and a sentence can sometimes see un seem unusually long. And I think what you've just explained, Deputy Chief, is that these reports can take time because they're so um, in, in depth and detailed. So. Well, that's true, although um, the assessments can be done in pretty quick turnaround time, but it's the think time for the judge that has to be taken into account. We can have uh, thought about this case, had a preliminary view, but no one, no judge is going to make up their minds before they've gone in and heard in open court what the parties want to place before them uh, to, for them to take into account for the plea. If it turns out that there's not much more that has uh, been added to, if it's been after a long trial when you've got a lot of material before you already, then you might be able to come to your decision fairly quickly and sentence um, later that day or perhaps the next day. That would be pretty rare after a trial, mm -hmm. but it might be possible after um, uh, certain types of uh, cases. But generally speaking, uh, this is a, a demonstration of how seriously, of course, we take this task. We want to think about it, weigh up the arguments, uh, go back and look at the cases that have been suggested to us for assistance, um, and then just give us uh, the time to come to the most appropriate sentence because of the complicated factor, uh, the complicated sentencing exercise that it is. We want to get it right, and therefore it can take some time. Um, and that also leads me to another thing, which is that uh, it is also rare for a judge just to um, uh, say the sentence um, outcome uh, off the top of their head. That is, they provide reasons for mm -hmm. this. We must provide reasons, and that's really done on the spot. It can be if, again, you've got all the material before you beforehand and you've had a, a good time to think about it and, and make a few uh, notes. But generally speaking, because we are so careful about it, because we want to get it right, because we want to explain to all of the people who are interested in this uh, outcome why we've got to the outcome that we have, uh, we need to take time to do that. And I can tell you that we go over them and we change this and we put that paragraph there and this one there and try and make it as understandable as possible um, as to why we've reached that outcome. And so, uh, Kimberly, that can take a bit of time. Thanks for that answer, Deputy Chief. Um, for you, Chief Judge, um, you've had a couple of questions around what considerations go to the cognitive or intellectual functioning of an offender when considering the sentence. And I think um, yeah. it might be worth exploring how that would affect your decision. Yeah, that's, a, that's certainly a very, uh, it's a good question. And um, taking up what the Deputy Chief Judge said about the sometimes the time that judges need to examine and reflect upon the evidence. Often the evidence that's placed before a judge in a sentencing matter may indeed relate to the, uh, the mental function of the offender in question or the mental state or indeed the impair mental impairment of the offender. So let's just take um, an example. You might have uh, a 35-year-old lucid, mature offender who committed an offence in a calculated, calculated way fully understanding the gravity and the gravity of the offending which he was engaging in and its wrongfulness. Uh, he may even need to have prior convictions for similar offending. Let's take armed robbery, for example. Now there, the sentencing judge uh, would be saying, well, uh, the full measure of punishment needs to be applied to that offender. Uh, he needs to be specifically deterred from offending again he fully understood what he was doing and needs to be punished. Contrast that, let's say, with a younger person, and the Deputy Chief Judge has spoken about the law relating to younger people. But let's say it's a younger person whose uh, mental functioning is impaired in some way. Uh, it, it, there are a variety of ways in which that might arise. Um, but if there's evidence before the judge which suggests that they were extremely immature, um, that they didn't, whilst they legally understood uh, that they were committing an offence, uh, their judgment uh, or their reasoning process was impaired to some degree. Um, and by comparison, for example, with that mature 35-year-old who fully understood what he was doing, that younger person with that mental impairment is not as morally culpable. And that's an assessment that judges need to make of offenders. How morally culpable are they? 
And mental impairment and the evidence before the court might suggest that this younger offender uh, is not as morally culpable as other offenders who don't have that mental condition. And that, of course, is done by reference to the evidence. Now, if their moral culpability is less, that will reflect upon the sentence. That younger person who didn't fully understand or fully reason what he was doing is likely to receive, and I certainly will receive, a more lenient sentence than that older, mature person who committed the offence in a calculated way. It may also bear upon the nature of the disposition that's imposed by the judge. That mental impairment uh, might be treated in some way, so the judge might impose a community corrections order uh, or some kind of order which involves managing that mental condition to ensure the rehabilitation of the offender, the younger person, to make sure that that person doesn't offend again, which is good for that person and also for society as a whole. Sometimes uh, also there's a mental condition involved. It might mean that the offender uh, will experience imprisonment in a more difficult way than someone who's uh, perhaps mature and without that mental uh, impairment. Um, if, if their mental condition means that they're more vulnerable, Perhaps they don't read the cues of other people. They're less able to protect themselves and they might, because of their mental state, find themselves getting into trouble in prison. Then they're likely to experience prison in a more burdensome way. Again, the court needs to take that into account in making its decision as to whether imprisonment's an appropriate sentence. And if imprisonment is an appropriate sentence, it might be that the judge will reduce that length of that imprisonment uh, because of the mental impairment and the difficulty which that person uh, will experience in prison. So it can come up in a variety of ways. Uh, and again, to pick up what the uh, Deputy Chief Judge said, um, the judge is not just making this decision on a whim. Uh, the judge will have evidence, usually a psychological report or a, psych a psychiatrist report, or maybe multiple reports before the court. That evidence might even be tested by way of cross-examination. And it can also be tested by reference to the facts and circumstances of the offence, which may of itself suggest that the person was uh, experiencing mental health issues at the time. Uh, so these things were all proceeded with logically, um, in, a, in a rigorous way, having regard to the evidence and the sets of legal principles which are built around how a judge should approach that issue. Thanks, Chief. Um, Deputy Chief, we've spent a lot of time talking about offenders. I think it might be a good time to turn to victims and complainants and what role the victim plays in the sentencing exercise. Yes, thanks, Ed. Um, it has always been a, um, a factor for judges to take into account the impact on the victim of the offending. But for um, many years now, there has been the uh, ability for the court to receive a victim impact statement. So that means that the uh, victim of an offence can write down um, or record, uh, if they don't want to write it, um, the perception that they have or the, the way that the uh, um, crime has impacted on them. So I said at the outset of that answer that judges always took into account the harm to a victim. But what a victim impact statement does is it gives you the specific harm to that specific individual. So just let me contrast that. You would um, be quite able to understand that a person who works in a 7-Eleven uh, and does the night shift, um, who is the subject of an armed robbery, um, uh, you know, with a, a long knife uh, flashed at them, uh, will suffer harm from that. That would be a terrifying experience. But if you actually get a victim impact statement from that person, you'll know about specific harm. That, for example, this was the third time this had happened to them, and even though the offender can't be uh, penalised for the previous uh, other offender's behaviour, it just means that the impact on that person was greater and it may be that they've said, I can't work in this job anymore and now I'm having trouble finding other work. So there, there's things that you know more because of that victim impact statement. The statements can be, I mentioned before, uh, written or uh, recorded. Uh, they can be pictures, they can be drawings. So 
uh, where appropriate children um, uh, in victims of, victims of sexual offences have provided drawings to the court. Uh, I once had a poem written by a victim that was uh, uh, read out, uh, which was very uh, moving. Um, and of course, the judge will take that into account. It's important to recognise that judges are human and although we are moved by these and we take them appropriately into account um, and we acknowledge the victims importantly, uh, that it's one factor that we have to take into account. And uh, so we might seem to be dispassionate perhaps in some ways, um, but that's because we are necessarily so looking at this as a logical exercise, as the Chief Judge said. But the victim impact statements have played a really important part in uh, allowing the victims to feel that they are um, acknowledged uh, in the, um, the judge's sentence. It's um, when there's a plea hearing, it can seem to a victim that the hearing is all about the offender, what they did, what their life has been, and what's going to happen to them. Uh, so, um, and that's appropriately so because the offender is the one that's going to get the sentence uh, of the court. So it's important that if um, the time that's devoted to the victim doesn't seem uh, as much as it, uh, that they might like, just in terms of the way that the judge has to take so many things into account, the important thing is that people understand the judge does take it into account and there isn't a judge's sentence that doesn't include a reference to that statement when they've had them really powerful statements that are often read by uh, victims themselves in court for the first time being able to feel that they can fully um, tell what the impact has been on them and on their lives. Thank you for that answer. I just remind everyone that there's still plenty of time for questions so if you have anything you'd like to ask the Chief Judge or the Deputy Chief feel free to uh, enter those questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, but I might start um, the next question with you, Chief Judge. Uh, we've had a few questions about mandatory sentencing. Mm -hmm. um, now, it might be worth just spelling some common things about that first in terms of how, how common it is in, in our jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but also explain what are the benefits, what are the pros and cons of mandatory sentencing and how does it apply? Mm -hmm. Well, to go back to um, my first answer today when I was asked to explain the general principles of sentencing very briefly, um, I emphasise, and I think we, we both said it on several occasions today, that the way in which we approach sentencing uh, under our system and traditionally is that we impose what's called individualised justice. And to pick up on some of the themes today, uh, what that really means is the individual circumstances of the case, the offending, the individual circumstances of the impact on the victim, and the individual circumstances of the offender. And uh, to use a few examples, which we've discussed today, the age of the offender, a 21-year-old offender, we will approach in a different way than a mature 36-year-old offender. Um, an offender uh, who's had um, some mental health issues which impaired their judgment. Uh, that too is an, an individual circumstance which will affect the way in which we approach sentence. We need to make a judgment about individual moral culpability. We need to make a judgment about the prospects of the reform or the prospects of rehabilitation for that individual offender. Uh, this is all done having regard to the evidence in that particular case. And I think the Deputy Chief Judge mentioned before that no cases, that there are no cases which are the same. Every case is different. So the objective of traditional sentencing is to ensure that we impose a just and appropriate sentence tailored to all the individual circumstances of the case with a view to trying to give proper weight to all of these sentencing considerations. It's not easy. It involves a difficult balancing exercise and indeed I think the term value judgment was used. Mm -hmm. But that's the way in which justice can best be served in the individual case. Now, mandatory sentencing comes at sentencing from a different angle. It starts to assume that one size fits all. It starts to say, well, uh, irrespective of the differences between these offenders, 
irrespective of the different circumstances of the offending, one sentence fits all. Everyone should go to jail. Everyone should go to jail, for example, for a minimum of, of four years. Mandatory sentencing can relate to mandatory jail or a mandatory minimum term. And so mandatory sentence starts to move away from this whole concept of trying to tailor the sentence to the individual circumstances of the offence. Under our Sentencing Act, uh, mostly it's still individualised justice. But there are some instances where Parliament, the legislature, and they're entitled to do this, have passed various laws, um, which in some respects constitute mandatory sentencing. For example, there are some categories of offences that they've listed where Parliament has said that a, a term of imprisonment, subject to some exceptions, but subject to those exceptions, a term of imprisonment is required, for example, intentionally causing serious uh, injury in circumstances of gross violence, to give one example. But uh, under our Act, there are a number of exceptions uh, and conditions which relate to the imposition of that mandatory uh, sentence. And indeed, usually one of the exceptions relates to the mental condition of the offender and some other factors. So we don't uh, yet have what you would call unqualified mandatory sentencing. And there's another category under our Sentencing Act which requires for certain offences for there to be a mandatory minimum term, again, uh, subject to certain conditions, and there are indeed some exceptions. So uh, apart from those, uh, individualised justice uh, remains uh, the case with most of the sentences which we impose. Thanks, Jean. Uh, Marion's got a really good question that I think is a good follow-on from that answer, which is, um, so we've spoken about the impact on the offender that needs to be taken into consideration, for example, if prison is going to be more burdensome. Mm -hmm. But is the judge able to take into account impact on, for example, the offender's family, hardship that might occur there, and, and how much weight, if any, can be put on that? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's a complex uh, answer. But in the, 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 like a lot of the law, there's a, a general answer, and sometimes there are some exceptions, and this is a, a good example. Generally, you don't uh, take into account as a mitigating circumstance the impact of the offender's family. Uh, the law recognises that uh, if we look at imprisonment, uh, the uh, consequences of imprisonment are terrible. Uh, they're obviously terrible for the offender, but they're also terrible for the offender's family. Whoever they are, whatever their social or economic circumstances, it's obviously devastating. But there are some exceptions to this general proposition that you don't take into account the, um, the, the suffering of the family members um, by losing their uh, partner, father, mother, as the case may be, to prison. Uh, and those, uh, th that general uh, exception is where there are what we would call exceptional circumstances. So they have to be truly exceptional. And I'll just give you an example of what's generally not exceptional. If that, say, the family has lost the breadwinner it's the father of the young children. He was the main breadwinner or the main person who was employed in the family. He goes to jail and it's a family already facing difficult uh, socioeconomic uh, consequences. And then because of imprisonment, um, they're even driven into potentially even poverty. Generally speaking, the law says, well, that's not exceptional. But there may be a case, for example, where the, uh, uh, the person in question, to keep with that same example, um, where perhaps two of the children have special needs and uh, those special needs can only be addressed um, with the parents in question, um, especially if, let's say, a child is terribly disabled and uh, always, needs one, always needs one parent. Uh, in which case the other parent has to be working. So there might be that kind of case where the circumstances become more exceptional. Um, they are, the law says, it should be rare. And the philosophy behind that, again, is that um, people, uh, the law ought to punish people for the offending that they've committed, taking into account, of course, their own individual circumstances. But we need to be careful to uh, treat people differently just because their extended family situations are different. Thank you, Chair. Can I just uh, add to that, um, that 
there is one uh, way that it can be um, taken into account, not on that basis, of course, but the Chief Judge said is correct, but you can take into account the impact on the offender, knowing that he has put his family into that really difficult, potentially devastating circumstance. So uh, if that uh, leads to, um, uh, for example, a diagnosis of depression um, uh, because of that impact that uh, is going to be on the family. So it's sort of a sideways move. It's not un undermining the principle that uh, the Chief Judge has talked about, but it is uh, to say that the law doesn't ignore it in terms of the person you're putting into prison. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about the ripple effect. That's a really good um, follow-up. Now, I'd like to think we've busted a few sentencing myths today with some of these responses. I think we've got time for one or two brief more questions. Um, so this is a good one uh, because I think it's one of the more common misunderstandings about how sentencing works. Concurrent versus consecutive. Um, Chief, would you be able to break down why, for instance, if someone's charged with multiple charges, convicted of multiple charges to mm. carry a long sentence, why aren't they stacked on top of one another? Mm. I'll try to give a simple answer to that, but again, like everything in sentencing, it's very complex, but all right. Um, well, let's look at uh, one example. Let's say there was some offending that all occurred um, as part of the one event. Um, there's a person who uh, uh, hijacks a car, uh, drives the car to then commit an armed robbery, and in the course of the armed robbery, assaults someone. Um, that person is injured. Uh, they then flee the scene. Now, obviously, there's there are a lot of offences which have been committed there: theft, uh, car checking, uh, armed robbery, and potentially uh, intentionally or recklessly causing injury or a, an offence of a similar kind. So when the judge comes to sentence that person for that, that all those offences, the judge needs to take account of the fact that in, indeed it was one event. Uh, these weren't all separate and discrete offences. One led to the other. And the judge needs to impose a, a total sentence, which is proportionate to the offending. Uh, and when considering the offending, as I said, it's, it's, it's one event. So what the judge would do there is the, the judge would say, well, each of these offences is serious. They need a term of imprisonment. And when I come to, when the judge comes to determine uh, how they're stacked upon each other, the judge must make allowance for the fact that it was one continuous transaction or part of the one event uh, with a view to arriving at a total sentence, which is proportionate to the overall offending. If the judge simply accumulated each of those sentences on top of each other, without taking into account that there is an overlap in the offending, then the ultimate outcome would be disproportionate to the offending. So what the judge does is effectively overlap the sentences to reflect that the offending itself was part of an overlap. So that's one way in which to answer that, that question. I thought it was a brilliant answer. <laughs> um, so uh, the... In the sex offences area, there is a particular provision um, that when a person has been uh, classified under the law in the Sentencing Act as a serious offender, and that's a particular term, uh, then the judge must stack the sentences um, and uh, unless the judge decides that it's not appropriate to do so and that the that principle of proportionality and totality still has a role to play there. Uh, so that's something, again, that the Parliament has recognised that uh, serious offenders, whether they're sexual offenders, and I've said that, but it's also violent offenders as well, uh, where that might come into, uh, into play. But you would still be uh, not ignoring the factors that the Chief Judge has referred to in deciding whether you say, well, I'm just going to stack all of them. Uh, I'm, no, I'm going to only stack a part uh, of them. Um, the other thing I just wanted to pick up on, something you said earlier, Ed, about the, uh, the Netflix effect, mm. and, of course, uh, we hear of sentences in uh, different jurisdictions in the United States where they get 150 mm. years, uh, and they do just stack them all on, um, and that's just not our system in Victoria. So it's fair to say that judges don't start at the maximum sentence and work their way back. That's a really good uh, point. Um, the maximum sentence is one of the things that we have to have regard to. 
it gives an indication of what the uh, what Parliament has said uh, is the objective seriousness of the offence. So an armed robbery, for example, picking that one up again, is uh, a 25 year maximum. But that's one factor to take into account. I hope during the course of this session, you've learned that there are so many other things that a judge has to take into account in creating that individualized sentence. And so as a result, uh, nobody gets the maximum, which is reserved for the most serious uh, offense. And why I say no one gets it, uh, this, the maximum is because not just this is other factors to take into account, but the law says that you have to allow there might be something even worse than the dreadful case you have in front of you. So you could approach the maximum, but you would never get there to allow for that. But in general, because of all these other factors we have to take into account, uh, the sentence um, is uh, uh, what the, the community would think is considerably lower than the maximum. Um, and there was another thing I was going to say about that, but it's gone out of my head. But can, can I say to that? that um... Uh, of course, judges are bound by the law, as we, we've sort of said several times today, and, and there is this set of legal principles, and they are clear that the maximum penalty is just one factor that we need to take into account. We do not start with the maximum penalty. It's a balancing exercise, and that's one factor along the spectrum of items or issues that we need to consider. Our sentencing is also not mathematical. Sometimes I think people consider that because there's a maximum penalty, which is a number, 25 years for armed robbery, the sentencing is in some way mathematical. It's not. If a judge were to engage in some kind of mathematical exercise, such as saying, well, this is a pretty serious offence, not quite the worst, but I'll start off with 20 years and then I'll start subtracting, the judge would be in error and that sentence would be overturned. So a judge doesn't do that for good reason. Um, and ultimately, it's the individualised uh, factors that uh, uh, need to be weighed into the balance in exercising that value judgment, the maximum penalty uh, being just one of them. The other point I wanted to make is that uh, there is a lot of talk about what is the worst uh, type of crime of a particular uh, offence, such as the, what, is, what, what does the worst um, robbery look like? Um, the only comment I'd make to that is that if you come to the county court on any day and you go into our courtrooms and you listen to the uh, offences uh, for which people are being sentenced, and of course, you know, subject to COVID, uh, uh, we encourage you to do that. It's an open court and it's, it's, we're doing work for the community and in no doubt, uh, it's, it has helped us also allow people to access our work uh, online. If you see that work, what you will see is the vast, vast, vast majority of offences and matters that we're dealing with don't even come close to the worst type of crime. Mm -hmm. Most of the crime that we're dealing with here involves people who've made a terrible mistake, but who have some prospects, often some real prospects of rehabilitation. And the law requires us, yes, to impose punishment, yes, to generally deter the public, but also to impose a sentence which allows that person to become a, a constructive member of the community at some stage, which is not only to that person's benefit, but it's to your benefit. It's to the community's benefit as well. I think that's a great place to leave it, Chief Judge of Deputy Chief. Thank you so much for those thoughtful answers. I think. Um, viewers we've gotten a lot out today and thank you for the fantastic questions I mean we do this every year and I think you'll agree that the questions get more insightful every time and it's just a very yeah. rewarding experience for the court um so that's actually the end of the event and it's the end of the court's law week program as a whole so thanks to everyone who's participated throughout the week um there's going to be a short survey popping up when this session ends just to help us um with the next law week so if you could take the time to fill that out we'd be very grateful um, and of course, uh, if you knew someone who couldn't make it today, or you might want to watch it again, um, we're publishing a recording of the session on our website next week, as well as the other two online events that we held this week. So once again, thank you to our panelists, Chief Judge and Deputy Chief Judge, and thanks to everyone for coming along. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.